So if you look at Exodus chapter 16 and verse number 8, the Bible reads, And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Okay, so the topic that we're going to be looking at this afternoon is murmuring against the Lord. And I'd use the, the word actually complaining. The title for the sermon today is Complaining Against the Lord. Complaining Against the Lord. And boy, you know, one of my personal pet peeves is complain, people that complain, complainers. And uh, people that murmur and whine and mope and, 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 and you know, whingers, as we say, you know. And, and uh, you know, this is something that uh, children quite often uh, are able to do. And it's something that, you, you know, as parents, we need to train our children out of this. And usually when someone complains and murmurs, it is because they are, they're just not happy with their life. You know, they're not happy. They just want to express their negativity. And quite often, they just want to bring other people along the ride and get other people upset and, and whining and complaining. But notice when it comes to the things of God, uh, you know, we had uh, the story here was, of course, the Israelites coming out of the land of Egypt, being led through uh, by Moses. And they were complaining because they didn't have the food, you know. And uh, so they complain, they murmur to Moses. And Moses, look, your murmurings, your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. And that's something that I really want you to understand that, yes, I personally, Pastor Kevin, doesn't like murmuring, doesn't like complaining, but God really hates it. I mean, it really, you know, upsets the Lord. It really angers the Lord. And in fact, if you can turn to Numbers chapter 11, I just want to show you how much it angers the Lord. Okay, Numbers chapter 11 and verse number 1. Numbers chapter 11 and verse number 1. And we're fast forwarding now, about two years, where Israel are, are in the wilderness for a couple of years. You know, God's been guiding them. God's been providing for them. God's been feeding them. And we're dealing here with the people of God. We're dealing with, you know, believers. We're dealing with the, the nation of Israel. We're not dealing with some ungodly heathen nation here. Look at verse number one. Here, number is 11, verse number one. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched, and he called the name of the place Taberah, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. Man, how much does God hate complaining? I mean, point number one is complaining angers the Lord. So much so that he sends this fire. We're not exactly sure where this fire comes from, if it's the fiery pillar or if it's some fire from heaven or something else. But he, he uh, uh, destroys or consumes many, it says in verse number, number one, consume that they were in the uttermost parts of the camp. So these are people that were on the fringes of the camp, not those that are close to the center, those that are in the, the fringes, you know, out, out, out the back. And you know what this reminds me of? I remember when I was in public school, if you wanted to basically not pay attention or you wanted to mess around in class, you wouldn't sit at the front. You'd sit at the back. You'd sit right at the back hoping your teacher can't see you. Okay? So those that would usually sit at the back were the troublemakers or people that just wanted to sleep and not care about their, their schooling. And, you know, the idea was if I sit closer to the front, then the teacher can see me. And, you know, usually those that were there for studies, that were there for learning, they don't care where they sat, but the troublemakers, the complainers, the whiners, the rebels, they would love to sit at the back of the class, wouldn't they? And so I think this is what we're seeing here. We're seeing in, in the uttermost parts of the camp, those that are less godly, those that, are, that less want to be uh, in the midst of Moses and, and the Lord, you know, they're out in the outskirts. They're the ones that are complaining and it upsets the Lord. It angers him so much that he sends this fire. I mean, this should open our eyes immediately about the sin of whining and murmuring and complaining. How much does God hate this? How much does God hate this? It drives me nuts. You know, it's one of the worst things as a parent, you know, when, when children complain. And again, this is something that we need to teach our children to be thankful for what they have. People that complain are upset because of what they don't have, 
rather than being thankful or content with what they do have. And that's the nature of complaints. And when we read uh, back in, um, in Exodus, they were complaining because they didn't have food. Okay? But they weren't thankful for where they have come. Hey, they were being enslaved by the Egyptians. The Lord delivered them in such a mighty and powerful way. Of course the Lord could provide for them. But they weren't focused on what the Lord was doing for them. They weren't content with the fact that they've been released out of Egypt. They just found something to complain about, you know, the, the food. And uh, of course, this upsets the Lord. And I don't want us to be people that complain against the Lord. Okay, people that complain against the Lord. Please go to the book of Jude in the New Testament. Go to Jude chapter 4. Jude chapter 4. Not only does complaining anger the Lord, but complaining is an attribute of a false prophet. Complaining is an attribute of a false prophet. Jude verse number four. Jude verse number four reads, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God, and our Lord Jesus Christ. So the book of Jude is warning us of these false prophets, these false teachers that creep into churches and their goal is to deny Jesus Christ. Their goal is to uh, bring condemnation into the people of God, right? Now drop down to verse number 16. Look at, look at verse number 16, drop down there. This is still referring to those false prophets. It says, these are murmurers complainers walking after their own lusts and their mouth speak of great swelling words having men's persons in admiration because of advantage what this is saying is they want to take advantage of other people and the way they go about doing this is they're murmuring and they're complaining say so what does that have to do with the false prophet how can these false prophets you know uh, lead people away from the lord because that's what complaining does. You know, again, there's something that you potentially feel is not right, is not fair, whatever that means. And instead of being content for what you have, you start to be discontent, you start to whine, you complain. And here's what's strange about the, about the sinful nature of man. That's a very attractive thing to be part of. It's addictive. You know, when someone's complaining, you kind of want to know what they're complaining about. You know, you kind of want to be able to give them an ear. For some reason, the, the flesh of man enjoys drama, enjoys, you know, people bagging out somebody else. And here's the thing about complainers. They can come to you and you've got no issue. You've got no complaints. You're not murmuring, but they come and start to express how they feel. And all of a sudden you feel, yeah, you're right. I do. You know, I should be complaining. I should be frustrated about this. But you wouldn't have been upset. You wouldn't have been frustrated by it if it not be for the complainer. You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me um, of a time when I was uh, em uh, employed for a company and I was newly employed and the union came up to me and said, hey, why don't you sign up for the union? You know, it, it's a couple of dollars every week that comes out of your pay and you can be part of the union. We'll make sure that you're taken care of. There's all these benefits. And I didn't think much of it. I was, you know, kind of young. Um, and I signed up for the union and, you know, and I was really thankful for my job the entire time. You know, I was thankful that I had landed a full-time job. I was thankful for how much I was getting paid. I signed a contract saying, hey, I'd get paid this much. I'm going to work this many hours. So we, I signed a contract. We had an agreement and then the union comes along. The union comes along. Well, we should be paid. We should be paid more. You know, this is not right. They're getting us to work all these hours. They're getting us to do all this kind of work. You know, if, it, if it's not for us, they wouldn't be able to accomplish the work that they're trying to do. And they were like, hey, you know, we're going to do a strike. We're going to strike and we're going to demand more pay. And I remember just going up to the people and saying, hold on. I had no idea that me signing up to the union was going to, uh, you, you're going to drag me into a strike. And they're like, yeah, but it's going to help you. You know, you're going to be able to get more money, blah, blah. And I said to them, but hold on, I'm happy with my job. I signed the contract. I agreed to these terms. I agreed to this pay. I agreed to this hour. And I'm happy that they've offered me a job. 
Uh, why did you sign the contract? If you were so upset, why did you sign? Why couldn't you go and find some other job uh, with some other hours and some other pay? Why do you have to come here and make this place a, a, a depressing place to work in? Hey, I was enjoying it. I had the job. I was making money. I was uh, learning new things. But then the complainers came. That was the union. They came. And here's the thing about that. Eventually, it started to wear me down. Eventually, I started to think, yeah, you know what? Maybe we should be paid more. Why? Because I had surrounded myself with complainers, with murmurers, people that are unhappy, and all they want to do is bring other people into their depression. And here's what the false prophets do. They come into the churches. They start whispering. They're in the outskirts of the congregation. You know, they try to hide themselves for a little while. You know, oh, you know what? You know, pastors should be doing like, things like this. And, you know, uh, why should we have to give, you know, uh, our tithes and our offerings to the Lord? And, you know, why can't we sing these songs instead? And, and before you know it, other people are like, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, you've got some good points there. You know, why don't we bring in the NIV? Why can't we try different Bible versions? Why is he preaching so strictly about these things? Why can't I have the freedom to, you know, you know why can't he preach on, on me just going to the beach and looking at nudity? And, and, and why does he have to warn me about that? And, and people start to murmur. People will start to complain. And, they, and the false prophets, they create a following. They create a following and because they have promised them to be able to accomplish something or, or, or benefit them in a way, and all they're trying to do is destroy that person's life, that cr person's Christian life, that person's testimony, or destroy the church altogether. And that is the way of the false prophet. The false prophet is a complainer. He's a murmurer. And so this is something that we need to get out of our system. You know? And as children grow up, you need to get this out of your system and understand the reason you whine and complain is because there's a sense of you, that inside of you there's, there's an idea that there's got to be justice and there's got to be fairness. Listen, there's no greater justice than what we see written in the Word of God. There's no greater judge than God Himself and God has given you parents. God has given you authority to make decisions that are right. It's not for you to complain and whine and murmur and make people's lives miserable just because it's not right with you. No, we base what is right on the Word of God. On the Word of God, okay? And when it comes to preaching the Bible, children especially, you need to be paying attention. You need to be listening to the preacher because he's preaching the Word of God to you. And the reason he's preaching the Word of God to you is so you can understand the righteousness of God, so you can understand the judgments of God, so you know what is right, you know what is wrong, and you do, what, you do righteously. And listen, if, if this world treats you unfairly, you just stand up for what's right. If you don't get, you know, if someone mocks you and someone uh, laughs at your faith, hey, you stand up for God, God will be pleased, God will look, look out for you. But if you're someone that starts to murmur and complain, well, we've seen the anger of the Lord. We can see that He sent the fire to destroy even His own people. So, number one was complaining angers the Lord. Number two, complaining is an attribute of a false prophet. Now, please uh, go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. <clears throat> John chapter 6. And I've sort of uh, skipped my notes a little bit here, but that's all right. John chapter 6 and verse number 60. John chapter 6 and verse number 60, the Bible reads, Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? Does this offend you? Point number three, complaining makes you resistant to hard preaching. Complaining makes you resistant to hard preaching. Jesus Christ in this story is preaching to many disciples, right? And it says in verse number 60, when the disciples heard, they said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? You see, Jesus Christ preached some hard preaching. He had some hard sayings, okay? When it comes to the Word of God, there are things that are going to upset you. There are going to be things that are hard to understand, things to digest, and things may offend you. 
Sometimes the, par- the, the preacher preaches and it might feel like a slap in your face. It might feel like your toes are being stepped on. But does that offend you? Jesus Christ asked that question, right? In verse number uh, 61, doth this offend you? Why does he say that? Because it says, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it. Okay, murmured at it. So you know what a whiner and complainer does? They murmur about the preaching. They murmur especially when it's hard preaching. Hey, they don't mind the preaching when it tickles their ears. They don't mind the preaching when they don't get challenged, when there's nothing in their life that they feel they need to change. But when it comes to something that is direct, something that they know within themselves that they need to change, the whiner and the complainer will resist the hard preaching. Listen, and that's why we need to get this attribute out of our lives because you, you, you need to not resist the hard preaching. You're not, not, you need not get offended by the hard preaching. You need to receive the hard preaching. Receive it. That's how you make changes in your life. When you understand what God's Word says and you say, look, no matter what, no matter how much this offends me, no matter how hard this will be for me, no matter what people have to say about me, if this is what the Word of God says, if this is what God wants in my life, then I'm going to make the necessary changes to do that. But the only way you can get to that point is if you stop murmuring and complaining. And you say, Lord, whatever the Word says, whatever your Word says, God, I'm going to do what I can to follow after you. I'm going to do the best I can, Lord. And where I fail, then I need your help. I need your strength to get me over the line. I need you to help me make the necessary changes in my life. Complaining makes you resistant to hard preaching. Please go to Luke chapter 19 now. Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. We won't read that just yet, but the next point that I have, complaining gives you a holier-than-thou attitude. Complaining gives you a holier-than-thou attitude. A lot of people have heard of that phrase, holier-than-thou. How many of you guys have heard that before? All right, do you guys know what it means? It basically means someone that feels they're so righteous next to someone else, you know, and and you have this attitude, this uh, lifted up attitude, this proud attitude toward those that are maybe not living as as righteously as you are, you know, not living as as Christian as as you are. And this comes from Isaiah 65 verse 5, which says, which say, stand by thyself, come not near to me, So these are people that say, look, stand over there, don't come near to me, for I am holier than thou. Don't come close to me, I don't want you to stay far over there, I'm holier, I'm more separated, I'm more righteous, you better stand over there because you may have an effect on me, all right? And And then it says this, these are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. What does God say? That there are smoke in his nose. It's, it's something that irritates the Lord. A holier than thou attitude. You know, imagine having smoke in your face, in your eyes. You know, it, it, may, it, it will make you uh, tear up. It might make you sneeze. And he says, look, that's what a holier than thou attitude is to, uh, to me. And if you guys are looking at Luke 19, because I want to show you this holier than thou attitude in Luke chapter 19 and verse number 5. Luke chapter 19 and verse number 5. It says, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I I must abide at thy house. So Zacchaeus, if you know the story, was was like a tax collector and he was a short one. So in order for him to see Jesus, he knew Jesus was coming through. In order for him to see him, he had to climb up a tree. So Jesus sees him up there on the tree and says, look, come down, I'll, I'll come into your house. Right? Look at verse number nine. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Now notice verse number seven. Here's the holier than thou attitude coming up here in verse number seven. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Oh, look at Jesus going over there. Oh, and they start complaining. They start whining. He's going to go around, hang around that sinner. He's going to go hang around that uh, publican, that tax collector who's been cheating people. Hey, that man's a sinner. And they separate themselves. Holier than thou. And they murmur and complain. Hey, God hates the holier than thou attitude. Now, should you be holier than this world? 
Should you be holier than the wicked? You should be in your Christian life. We should be striving to live good, separated lives. You know, righteous lives, upright lives for the Lord. But when someone is not at our level, or someone is struggling in the faith, it's not for us to be, pop, to be uh, lifted up and, uh, and, and have that attitude and say, oh, you stay over there because I can't have anything to do with you. Hey, listen, if you're doing right, you should be able to go to that sinner, you should be able to go to that weaker Christian and encourage them and edify them and lift them up. You know, that's, the, that's what you do. It's not about putting people down. It's about lifting other people up. And so you have those that are watching Jesus with the holier than thou attitude. Hey, but there was someone that was holier than those complainers, and that was Jesus, and he had no problem hanging out with a sinner. He had no problem fellowshipping with a guy that was struggling in his faith, the guy that had some sin in his life, because Jesus wanted to lift up Zacchaeus. Jesus cared for Zacchaeus. And, you know, the complainer will be all about themselves, lifting themselves up, thinking that they're so much better than the person next to them. You know, it's a a horrible attribute to have, complaining. And once again, kids learn this at an early age. Remember, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. You know, kids learn this at an early age, and it's, it's the responsibility of the parents to drive this out of them. And listen, if, if the kids don't get this changed, they're going to become adults that are murmurers and complainers and mopers. Boy, there's nothing worse than a child complaining. I mean, sorry, there is something worse than a child complaining, and that's an adult complaining, an adult being a whiner and a, and a murmurer, okay? So complaining gives you a holier-than-thou a holier attitude. Can you please turn to the book of Mark? Mark. Mark chapter 14, please. Mark chapter 14 and verse number 3. Mark chapter 14 and verse number 3. Complaining blinds you to the good work of others. Complaining blinds you from others that do good work. Okay? Look at Mark 14 verse number 3. The Bible reads, And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment and spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there was some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of ointment made? So you have this story of this lady that comes to Christ with this ointment, very expensive ointment, and she pours it upon the head of Jesus Christ. Okay? She was given honor to Christ. She was willing to give up something that is very precious to her and give that to the Lord. Okay? And there, there are those that are complaining. In verse number four, look at verse number five. For it might have been sold, that's the ointment, it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. Look at this. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She have wrought a good work on me. So do you see the, the people that are murmuring and complaining, when a woman comes in and does a good work to Jesus Christ, they can't see the good work. They complain, they murmur, oh, she could have done something else with that ointment. It could have been used for other purposes. And brethren, we need to be mindful that there are other Christians doing good works for God, other believers, other churches that are, are soul winning, other people that are, you know, other pastors that are teaching their people how to live godly lives, how to live lives that are pleasing for the Lord. Hey, there are other good Christian churches out there. We can never have the attitude that, oh, it's just us. Oh, and, and then when, when other churches and other met, uh, believers do some great work for God, that we just thumb our, our nose at it. Okay? And that's what, you know, why, or they could have done things differently. They could have gone, you know, gone about it some other way. And you start complaining and you don't see the good work that they are doing for Jesus Christ. Okay? Murmuring and complaining blinds you to the good work of others. Okay? Now, <clears throat> actually, look at verse number 9, same chapter. Mark 14, verse number 9. Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, whether soever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she have done, 
sorry, this also that she have done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. So Jesus was so appreciative for what the woman did with her ointment, pouring it upon his head, anointing him with that oil, that he says, look, this will be remembered. This will be preached. This will be spoken about, you know, for a memorial for her throughout the whole world. He said, how did that happen? Well, it's in the word of God, isn't it? And I'm preaching about it today. We're fulfilling what Jesus Christ said right now, that there will always be this memorial for what this woman did. Okay? And so, once again, be careful of complaining. Be careful of murmuring. God hates it. And it really destroys your character. It destroys your testimony. And it makes you uh, upset. It makes you depressed. It makes you unthankful. And it causes you not to be able to appreciate what others do for the Lord. Let's keep going. Psalm 144. Please go to Psalm 144 and verse number 12. Psalm 144 and verse number 12. And I've been been talking about the children because uh, this is a great passage that kind of points to children here. Psalm 144 and verse number 12. The next point that I have for you is that complaining children create an unhappy household. Complaining children create an unhappy household. Look at verse number 12. The Bible reads, That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. All right, so we want our sons and daughters to be wonderful children. We want them to be godly children. The sons here as plants growing up in their youth. We want to see our sons grow, be strong, be hardworking, be fruitful. And we want our daughters to be as cornerstones, firm, strong, right? It says polished after the similitude of a palace. We want them to be pleasing. We want them to be rich in character, right? Our daughters. So we want the best for our sons and our daughters. Look at verse number 13. That our garners may be full, affording all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets, that our oxen may be uh, strong to labor. Notice this, uh, that there be no breaking in, nor going out. Now notice the next thing here, that there be no complaining in our streets. There are things we want. We want good children. Hey, we want that productivity. You know, we want fullness. It said there, verse 13, 14, and something we definitely want is no complaining in our streets. Now, notice verse 15. So if there is no complaining in the streets, look at verse 15. Happy is that people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. And look, I want to be happy. I want you to be happy. I want my children to be happy. And you know what? If we want to live joyful, happy lives, we need to get rid of the murmuring and the complaining. No complaining in the streets. No complaining in the house. No complaining in the church. We need to raise our children to be faithful, productive, strong. Okay? Be thankful. Let's teach our children to be thankful for the things that God has given them. And God has given them so much. God has given them parents. God has given them a home. God has given them an education. God has given them plates, free meals a day, right? God has given them so many things. And, uh, you know, I'm talking to the children here. You know, you better make sure that if you're someone that just mopes and complains and whines, you take this out of your system. Because I'm telling you now, you're going to grow up to be a very unhappy person. And people aren't going to want to hang around you. People aren't want to going to be your friends. Okay, if this is the attitude you have, you know, for a while, yes, the complainer gets attention. But after a while, when that person just continues complaining, continues whining, continues moping, people are just not going to want to be part of that. Why would I want to hang around a depressing person that brings me down, that causes me to complain? Hey, naturally, people want to hang around people that give them joy, that they enjoy the fellowship, they enjoy that person's company. Not the murmur and the complainer. Complainer. Please now go to Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two and verse number fourteen. Philippians chapter two 
and verse number 14. Next point that I have is complaining snuffs out your light. Complaining snuffs out your light. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. That's very clear. That's black and white. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Everything. Listen, children, when your parents ask you to pick up the toys, when they ask you to clean up your rooms, when they ask you to do the chores, do it without murmuring and disputing. Do all things. And you might be saying, why are you, why are you attacking the children? I'm saying to the, even the adults, when your boss says, can you finish that project? Can you submit that work? Can you give me an update? Can you come to a meeting? Hey, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Hey, honour the authority that God has put in your life and, and follow it through. If you're being asked to do something, don't be rebellious. Don't be a whiner. Don't be a complainer. Do what is right. And I promise you this, if you just do things without murmuring and complaining, you're going to be very happy in your life. You're going to be more productive in your life. Verse number 15, that ye may be blameless and harmless the sons of God, without rebuke, in, a midst, in, the, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Look at this. Among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Listen, we live in a crooked, crooked and perverse nation. Australia is a crooked and perverse nation. This world is a crooked and perverse nation. But how are you going to shine your lights? How are you going to be the light in the world? How are you going to reflect Christ in this world? Well, I'll tell you how. By being blameless and harmless, as I said there in verse number 15. Not one that is murmuring and disputing. If you just live a life of murmuring and disputing, and that's what you become known for, you've snuffed out your light. You're just like the uh, crooked and perverse nation. You're just like the ungodly people around you, and you're not reflecting Jesus Christ at all. Hey, if anyone had the right to murmur and complain, it was how people treated Jesus Christ. And hey, he did all things without murmurings and disputing. Jesus Christ is our ultimate example. And Jesus Christ says of himself that he is the light of the world, but then he's made us the light of the world. And listen, if you are whining and complaining, you cannot shine the light of Jesus Christ. You cannot stand out from the crowd as a Christian. Let's keep going there in verse number 16. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Boy, you know, as your pastor, I want to be able to rejoice in the day of Christ. I want to be able to rejoice when Christ comes back and I have to present this church to the Lord and say, hey, I had a church that was full of people that were blameless. I had a, a church full of people that were harmless. Rather than saying, Lord, well, we had plenty of murmurers and complainers around here, many disputers going on, you know, in this church. No, I want to have the heart of Paul that I can look at the church and say, Lord, I can rejoice in the day of Christ. I'm ready to present New Life Baptist Church to the Lord. And look, you want to be effective for the Lord, don't you? In this, in this dark world, in this crooked and perverse nation. Well, you need to shine your light. And you start by not murmuring and complaining and disputing you do all things without those things, without the murmuring and the disputings. All right. So <clears throat> instead, of, uh, instead of complaining, what do we do? Instead of complaining, well, as we saw in, in Philippians 2, uh, 14, it says, do all things without murmuring and disputing. So that's where we start. Okay, if you're someone that's just always complaining, always whining, well, start by stop doing it. Just stop. Just say, God, this is a problem in my life. I need to overcome that. Can you please help me? Okay, but let's build a bit of context on this. Let's go back to verse number 12 in the same chapter, Philippians 2, chapter 12. It says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed. Hey, there's a good way of looking at things, right? You have always obeyed. Always obey. Children, what is your requirement from the Lord? To obey your parents. Isn't that what the Lord wants from you? to obey your parents. That's a great place to start. And when you obey your parents, 
should you murmur and complain? Should you mope and no, no. Should should you have a up, you know a frown on your face when you obey your parents, or should you have a smile on your face and be thankful that your your family can your your parents can give you instruction? Because you know what, your parents tell you to do certain things because they want you to grow. They want you to learn how to work and not be lazy, and not to be selfish, and not to be a whiner and complainer. Okay. And uh, look at, so we were said, as you have always obeyed, but look at this, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my presence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So what are the, how can we, uh, instead of complaining, what can we do? Well, what, what do we see? Number one there, always obey, right? Always obey. Number two, Work out or exercise or pr produce you know, uh, your works for the Lord, your service for the Lord with fear and trembling. Remember the, what God did when the Israelites murmured and complained. He sent a fire and consumed a number of them. Could you imagine seeing people just lit on fire by God, just going to their death, burning in flames? That's how much God hates murmuring. That's how much God hates complaining. Now, you ought to have a good dose of fear and trembling when you think about the obedience that you need to be doing. Yes to your parents, yes to the Lord, yes to those that have authority over you. And number three, how do you measure up with what we read in verse number 13, which says, <clears throat> For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. See, not only does God want us to do his good pleasure, but he wants us to will it. See, God wants us to shape our will into his will. You know, God many times will ask us to do many things. You'll be reading your Bible and you'll be saying, Lord, a part of you'll be like, I can't do that. But God wants you to change your will and say, well, not my will, but thy will be done. God wants us to be willing to follow and, and do the commands that is laid out for us in the Bible with obedience and without complaining. How well do you measure up? When you see something in the Word of God, you know you should be doing certain things. Do you murmur and complain? Or is your will aligned with what God wants? And that's probably the best way for you to be able to measure whether you're someone that will be, that will be obedient, with a smile on your face, that will have joy in the life, or somebody that is just a whiner, complainer, and a murmurer, you know, by knowing how close does your will line up with the will of God, okay? And when your will is lined up with the will of God, you're more likely to do that which is right with joy, with a smiling face, without the murmuring and the complaining. And so, can you, let's, let's just go to one more passage. Let's go to Job chapter 10. Job chapter 10. Job chapter 10, if you can. One more passage here. Because there's a man in the Bible, Job, who definitely had reason to complain. Okay, remember he lost it all. He lost his family, lost his children, lost his possessions. He lost his cattle. I mean, this is a man who definitely had a reason to whine and murmur and complain. And Job is so amazing. His character is so amazing. Look at verse number one. Job says, My soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. He goes, look, I've got a complaint. I'm not happy with what's happened here, but I'm going to leave it upon myself. I'm not going to go to God and complain. I'm not going to go to God and whine and, and murmur and, 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 uh, and upset the Lord. I'm just going to leave it with myself. He goes, I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. What does he do? Does he complain to God? Verse number two, he says, I will say unto God, do not condemn me. Show me wherefore thou con content, uh, contendest with me. He says, look, instead of complaining to God, I'm going to go to God and say, look, God, don't, don't destroy me. Can you tell me what is wrong? Can you tell me what I need to fix? Instead of being the whiner and the complainer. Listen, next time you're driven to complain, and we know that complaining is something that God hates. 
next time, instead of taking that complaint to your parents or to your boss or to your church pastor or to, to God himself, why don't you go up to the person in authority and say, look, I've got this bitterness in me. I'm not happy. Is there something that I need to change? What is it that I need to do, Lord? What is it that I need to change? Why are you allowing me to grow, go through this difficulty, Lord? I don't want to whine and complain. I don't want to be like the Israelites of old, where you consumed them with fire. I want to work out what it is that you have against me, Lord, so I can fix that. And that's the heart of Job. I mean, we know that Job, God says he was perfect and upright, you know. And still, he was willing to be examined by God and say, God, I'm not going to complain. I want to find out exactly what it is that I need to fix up in my life. I mean, that's a great attitude to have, okay. So, complain against the Lord. You know, I don't want to raise a, children, uh, a generation of whiners and complainers. I want to raise a, a generation of children that are thankful to the Lord that are thankful for what they have, that have a smile on their face when they're obedient and who are striving to uh, you know, uh, change their will to be more like the will of God. Okay, let's pray.